Hello, everyone, and thanks so much, Anusha, for that introduction. Um, like Anusha said, my name is Mary Reagan, and I'm a data scientist at Fiddler, and I'm excited to be able to host this panel. Um, today, we're going to be discussing the future of explainable AI. And so our panel will generally discuss the latest in AI research, industry trends and applications, and where XAI is headed. Um, so maybe let's just start off with um, a little brief introdu introduction from each person. So, um, Merve, would you like to go ahead and start? Sure, I'll start. Uh, so my, my name is Merve Hickok. I'm the founder of AIethicist.org. Um, I'm an independent consultant and trainer working on capacity building and uh, capacity building towards ethical AI, uh, ethical use of AI and governance. Uh, I'm also a senior researcher at Center for AI and Digital Policy and a contributor to For Humanity, which is a nonprofit building uh, audit systems for AI. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you, Merve. Uh, Sarah, would you like to go next? Hi, it's lovely to be here. So uh, as mentioned, I'm a researcher at Google Brain. A lot of my research is how do we train models to fulfill multiple criteria? So not just high test performance, but robust, fair, compact. And in particular, I'm really interested in uh, having a more nuanced conversation about how these properties trade off against each other. So when we optimize for compactness, do we give up robustness? and understanding that we're always making a choice about what properties we want when we train a model. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. And Narina, what about you? So, hi, um, I'm Narina, I'm a research scientist at Facebook, and um, I support model understanding efforts at Facebook as part of the Responsible AI Applied Research Group and the Captain Project. Um, so we develop generic algorithms and tools that help model developers to debug and better understand their models. So we work both with um, production and the research projects, um, and we have internal and external collaborators and contributors on those efforts and projects. Great. Thank you, Narina. Um, so let's get started with this first question. So we all know that explainable AI, the need for it is just growing quite rapidly. Um, so I, I'm going to pose this question to each of you. We'll go around, like, where are you seeing the need and adoption of explainable AI today? Um, so maybe let's start with Narina. Um, yeah, so I think ideally it would be amazing to have explainability options for most machine learning models, but certainly there are some fields of industry and research um, for which explainability is more critical. And uh, for example, some of those fields are healthcare, bi biotech, and any field where human trust um, is inevitable. Um, so um, I think in terms of research, um, I think we, from explainability perspective, um, if we better understand them, something, the more likely it is that we will improve it. So I see that um, that will help us to push the boundaries of a cutting edge research. So I think it's it's a, definitely a plus point for uh, for all fields of research, but definitely some cases where trust is inevitable, that's more and more important. Right, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Sarah, what is your perspective on this? What's well, interesting, Norena's already brought up a really good point, which is that we may not always place as much emphasis on interpretability, it depends upon the task, but also that interpretability is not a binary um, property. So we don't just achieve a term interpretability, sign off a model, and essentially launch it. So a lot of what I'm interested in, in terms of what's happening with interpretability tools, is moving it from something that people feel like is a checklist that they have to tick off before they launch something, to something which is part of how you develop a model and how you understand how your model performs after you launch. And also to understand that different uh, different users will need different things. So when you're deploying a model, it's much more likely that you want to understand the relative distribution of your data set. 
we have very large scale data sets now. How do we surface what is most important for a human to look at? Whereas as a consumer, as if, you're, if you, you are the recipient of a model prediction, you're always going to want to know for your prediction, why did the model perform the way it is? And these are not the same tools and they're not the same techniques. So having more nuance about what we, what we mean by valuable interpretability tools that provide intuition, I think that's all very exciting uh, and something that's changing rapidly as we tailor interpretability more to where it's needed. That's great, thank you. Uh, Merve, what do you think about this? Um, I think coming from an ethics and governance perspective, I'll follow on with what Nerina and Sarah has mentioned, uh, where it is needed. Um, I think where we are standing right now in lack of regulations or like it, in the absence of regulations or like former guidelines, we're looking at where you got the highest harm um, or where you're going to get the most value out of adoption, okay, interpretability or explainability adoption, or where you could re reduce the risk more, most. Um, and that's I think why we keep going back to high stake situations, uh, high stake in terms of impact on individuals, impact on, on, on groups. Um, so for governments, those uh, need an adoption for, uh, could be, uh, where you know, looking at military or intelligence services or public services, where you're using AI for welfare and benefits and education, et cetera, for commercial entities, uh, you're probably looking at the highest need right now is the industries that are already regulated and would require uh, explainability or interpretability to, to prove that uh, you are meeting what you're you're saying uh, that you're doing. So things like uh, credit, insurance, employment, housing, banking, uh, to a certain extent, healthcare. Um, and you want to safeguard against bias and you know not deepening the or reinforcing the all, all already unjust or imbalanced conditions. Um, but uh, uh, I would like to come back to this. I don't want to take the whole time, but I would like to come back to this as use cases. You know, like bias should not be the only reason uh, for the need and adoption of XAI uh, or con you know, consumer requests should not be the only reason. There are multiple use cases for AI. Uh, I think what is going to impact the adoption most is when, if and when uh, these systems you know, audit of these systems is going to be a legal requirement, uh, whether in addition to the already existing legislation or things like Algorithmic Accountability Act or bias audits uh, legislation, etc. cetera, um, then you will have more need for uh, XAI and interpretability. Can you just briefly expand on that a little bit more on why you think bias shouldn't be the only reason for to push for explainable AI? Yeah, absolutely. So bias is one of the biggest reasons, right? So bias, uh, you know, not debiasing, uh, but you know, minimizing the bias and you know, mitigating the risk that comes with bias is one of your biggest big, biggest goals. Uh, but other use cases around this is, um, you know, if you're able to explain or understand your own model, um, that you can validate your model and hopefully prevent any, you know, spurious correlations that you're pushing onto your clients or you're pushing to like public services, wherever the use case is. So you're not suggesting something spuriously is one thing. Uh, obviously optimizing performance is another thing. Um, protecting your model against any adversarial attack uh, so it you know it's not performing as it is so being able to monitor your model performance uh, either for adver against adversarial attacks or for drift is another thing and kind of I'm going back to governance and audit um, another biggest use case for me is going to be unless you're building white box models to start with uh, another biggest use case is going to be um, being able to document your model's decisions uh, and interactions so it becomes more auditable and traceable. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I think, you know, really kind of you've touched on bias a little bit and we've all heard about these recent like really high profile snafus that black box AI has caused. Um, how do you all see the need for XAI changing moving forward? And uh, Narina, why don't we start with you? Um, yes, yeah, so um, I think, um, so with the increase of ML applications um, in various uh, fields of industry and research, um, so explainable AI is becoming more and more important. And we have more and more ML practitioners using ML in for various different of applications. So um, I think one thing that those model developers realize is although they understand the theory, um, it's not sufficient to actually say uh, how does my model make decisions and how we can potentially change that, influence those decisions. So I think moving forward, um, the model developers, the ones who put the architecture together, they will put more emphasis on inherently interpretable model. So they will try their best and um, to make their models as interpretable as possible. At least certain components can be interpretable. Um, but uh, from other side, there will be still some models that are black box and we would need those post hoc explanations um, and tools and techniques that will allow us to monitor our models based on those explanations. Um, I also think that moving forward, people will not just rely on one explanation or one, one technique, but they will explore uh, various different techniques and look at it from using different lenses. Um, and I think those techniques will ultimately become um, part of the ML pipelines as well. Yeah, wonderful, so interesting, thank you. Um, Sarah, what about you? How do you think about this? I love following Narina because I always find myself nodding along. I mean, the part that when Narina talked about that excites me the most is this idea that we make interpretability tools easy enough for people to use on an ongoing basis and not just when it's the model has done something wrong. How do we how do we retroactively explain behavior? Right now, I'm guessing everyone who's attending this tour cares about interpretability, wants to weave interpretability into their how they do work, how they work with data. However, there's still formidable challenges. There's not an easy roadmap for someone to say, how do I integrate this? I want to gain more transparency and insight into my model. And I would say there's two big obstacles. One is that when it comes to complex models, we've done a lot of work on local explanations, so explanations for single examples. But because of primarily like computational costs, less work on how do we do global feature importance? How do we surface a subset of the distribution that's most important for someone to look at? The second is that a lot of our even local explanation methods remain quite costly to compute and there's less work. Um, and I, I, there's, I know um, that projects like, for example, uh, Narina is involved in Captum, they're doing more multimodal work, but there's less work also on how do we do multimodal explanations. So that, that's one of the primary gaps that I see that's really interesting is how do we actually take all the research that's been done in interpretability and translate that to tooling which practitioners can use in an interesting way and can weave into that actual deployment pipeline and not just be, now I have to understand because something has gone wrong. Um, and then the other aspect of this in terms of why this is perhaps gained more urgency is that these, uh, the way that we're applying these models is often across very different tasks with an emphasis on uh, transfer learning, fine tuning existing weights for unexpected use cases. So there's just a lot more uh, in the wild scenarios where our expected properties of generalization may not match with what happens in reality. And we need better ways to anticipate these discrepancies proactively rather than retroactively. That is so excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Merve, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, you mentioned this, the, like how the 
recent high profile snowfalls or headlines is, is changing the uh, need for XAI. I think one of the things that is pushing, although sometimes headlines are kind of misleading if you're not understanding some of the concepts, uh, what, it, what they're doing is uh, making consumers and to a certain extent citizens more aware of um, uh, certain risks and harms and holding the, the vendors or government, like the agencies who are using these systems more accountable and more liable to what, what, what they're, they're using or developing. So I think that will, that, that is one thing that's going to drive. Um, but also there is already stuff in place like GDPR and explainability requirements in GDPR where the regulation is there, but we're not sure how to implement that or how to enforce that. So people are just like the vendors or organizations are just trying to uh, figure that out and kind of play it by the ear <laughs> as the demand is growing. Uh, where I see, and apologies for the grandfather clock at the background uh, uh, that I cannot unplug, but um, one of the things that is going, what is going to push or change in the landscape, I think is, uh, if you can't explain, you might actually start creating, look to create inherently or natively and interpretable or explainable models. So if you're in a high stakes situation, kind of shifting that to, you know, inherently gray or white boxes rather than putting another tool on top of the black box to explain the whole thing. Uh, I, I think that will be context, context specific and context sensitive going forward. Um, Narina mentioned having a portfolio of methods, and that's a very legit issue, and that's a very legit, you know, uh, suggestion. Uh, looking at the different trade-offs or decisions that you want to make, I think you need the whole portfolio and not be stuck with one single um, option, because again, that will also be context sensitive. And ideally, my hope is uh, as more research is going into this that we might actually come up with new methods where you don't have to make that trade-off between performance versus accuracy or explainability, you know, that uh, hopefully eventually th there will be some methods that trade-off is not, not a concern. Right, yes, thank you so much. Um, you know, we've, I think all of you have touched on this already, um, but maybe a slightly deeper dive from each of you in terms of what you think some of the challenges of using explainable AI are today um, and how you see that changing moving forward. Um, so, Narina, let's start with you. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. I think um, Sarah also mentioned about it um, in the first question um, that some of the challenges of using explainable AI for black box models is that those post hoc um, explanations might be misleading and um, they sometimes make an impression of a confirmation bias. Then people look at that explanation score and say, how shall I interpret it? Uh, then they try to compare explanation scores for, from different methods and say, how, why is this one higher and this one lower and how should I understand it? Um, especially for feature neuron importance score, let's say. So um, I think that one problem here is that um, th that we are, or we are trying to summarize or explain something as complex as a neural network with a score, which is obviously not a sufficient illustration of a true behavior of a decision of a model. Right. So I think when we use an explanation technique, we expect it would give us like a perfect answer. Uh, but we also have to understand what does this method do? What are the limitations? What I can expect from this method? And uh, some of those techniques for feature importance score, they are just a tool. They can uh, be useful but they are not perfect. They are far from being perfect and evaluating the explanations is even harder. Um, I think what can help here is, um, as I mentioned in the previous um, question, that we having a toolbox of different techniques and looking at a model 
using different lenses. For example, feature importance or attribution lens is one perspective. But to understand something complex, we need to look at it from various different perspectives and then come, a, come to a conclusion based on those different techniques, such as do correlation analysis, look at the interaction of features in relation with the model, um, and do various different analysis before we come to a conclusion. That's wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Very helpful. Um, Sarah, do you want to build on uh, either what Narina has said or, or do you have any other thoughts? Um, so I can tell why Narina did a, a mention of, of my grumpiness in this topic. A lot of my research has been on how do we evaluate the reliability of explanation. It may be meaningful to a human, but is it a reliable and faithful explanation of model behavior? And the second point is very critical because uh, uh, incorrect explanation is worse than no explanation at all in very sensitive domains. So I do think that remains a big concern. Uh, how do we, we have many different methods to choose from. How do we compare the merits of reliability? And there has been interesting work in this direction. The core challenge um, is that we're trying to map a very high dimensional space into dimensions that humans can understand. And humans, frankly, struggle beyond two dimensions. <laughs> so, so we're facing this massive challenge of how do we make something uh, meaningful while still ret retaining fidelity. And part of that is that what is missing right now is a sense of relative importance. So with local explanation methods, often you are left with, well, you have this explanation in front of you, what next? Is this good? Is this bad? Um, you see some clustering of like importance in one part of the image. Uh, but where do you go from there? Do you, does this require further auditing? And part of that requires more methods that surface parts of the distribution that the model is uncertain about and that require uh, a comparison of what is a clean part of the distribution versus what is more challenging. Um, that also requires cheaper uh, computational methods. One reason we don't do this as often is that it's very expensive currently to scale across High dimensional input spaces. So that's an engineering challenge as well as a research challenge. But I think there's some exciting work that's happening right now that is really reducing our cost of giving that relative. So maybe instead of just looking at saliency for one explanation, when you look at that saliency map, it will also surface similar attribution maps. And you gain an understanding of where this data point fits within the overall corpus of your training data or your test data. That's so excellent. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, Merve, what do you think about this? Like, um, what do you think about some of the challenges of using XAI today? I think I'm going to continue with Sarah's uh, comments, but kind of flip that around from a user perspective, uh, not from a vendor or developer perspective. So uh, when we're talking about ethical or responsible development or use of uh, AI systems, we were always saying, you know, embed ethics uh, throughout the life cycle, right? It's constant, proactive, iteration, and improvements, etc. But a, a couple of the steps in there is the feedback uh, from when when you release it into into the world, the, the f getting feedback from your users, getting feedback from the system, and kind of monitoring that and using that to improve your systems. So I think one of the challenges with XAI right now is, from a user's perspective, is um, kind of lack of user feedback. So, you know, you might explain your systems in ways that you think are, might be helpful to the end user, with whichever platform or system that you're using, but are you getting uh, like how much feedback are you getting uh, from the users if that was helpful, if that was complete, etc. And if you're getting any feedback, is that representative of uh, your user base? You know, it's uh, is it representative of the wider population, or is it people just like expert users who are more interested in providing the feedback, or who you know who are more impacted? So that's one thing about the 
explainability piece and the users. The other piece is uh, a thing that's more important is users not having the control to change anything once they see the explanation. So, for example, you might provide a user uh, an explanation that like, you're seeing this post because you have previously searched for this item. Uh, or you might say you see this because your information was included in a data set bought by this company or similar uh, stuff, you know, so your explanations might be different. I see that as a user, then what? What am I doing with it? You know, it's like I don't have the controls. I don't have the ability to control or change that in most platforms yet. So explanation versus control over that for the user end is, is I think, crucial. So can I change my settings? Can I delete the information that is making, like, reaching, making the model reach that uh, conclusion or that suggestion? Or can I say, do not sell my data, <laughs> so they're not uploading it on the, onto the platform, or no, just delete this item from my browsing history and you know refresh the model, etc. Just explanation itself also is not going to be enough for users. Right. Thank you so much, Merve. Um, Sarah, can you talk about some ongoing and upcoming XAI research advances that you find exciting right now? Uh, I think to perhaps uh, I've given away this question already. I've spoken a lot about this idea of relative importance and cheaply doing it. So a lot of my recent research has been how do you surface the parts of the data set? How do you allow human to choose that the model considered is more challenging versus easier? But also, as a secondary aspect of that, we've talked a lot about post hoc methods. Uh, and in fact, most interpretability methods have taken as a given the model. It's trained, it's done, and then you're trying to do acrobatics after training to introduce interpretability. And what I think is a very interesting research direction is why do we do that? We have far few degrees of freedom at the end of training. Uh, can't, why can't we think about the training process itself and how we treat different examples during the training process as a way to garner interpretability and end up with uh, a, a function that's considered more interpretable? Um, and then uh, the final piece is multimodal explanations. The majority of interpretability research has focused on computer vision up until very recently, and now there's more work on NLP, uh, but still very little work on audio. And this partly has to do with what data formats we already find quite interpretable. <laughs> but uh, there has to be more work on how do we work on unifying methods across different modalities. The other big hurdle is cascading models. Uh, Merve talked about this idea of switching paths to a white box model if, uh, if the black box model is considered a too high stakes given the end use case. But, one thing I see a lot in industry is that you may actually be having various models that are considered white box interpretable, but because they're cascading or ensembling in different ways, you still end up with the same issues of how do you attribute what each model is doing to the end prediction. And this is very common in production settings where you may, a prediction may be a composite um, of various different model functions. So how do we do that in a system where either these models are sequential or parallel? It's so interesting. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, let's see, Narine, can you talk a little bit about Captum? So really, what is it? And what is Facebook's philosophy around model understanding and, and, and you know, your decision to invest in explainability? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, Captum is a generic um, unified model interpretability library that helps uh, model developers to um, better understand the model internals and their predictions. So we support all types of PyTorch models, um, including multimodal and graph-based neural network. Um, so the library is open source, and we open source the first version that has um, a, a list of different types of attribution algorithms that help you to understand important neurons, layers, and features of your model. So as next, we are expanding uh, the library to include other um, perspectives and other lenses, such as robustness, so that could be 
um, adversarial attack and de defense, as well as the robustness of model in general, in terms of accuracy uh, to various different perturbations. Uh, also correlation analysis, uh, like looking into feature interactions, concept-based interpretability, and also exploring different areas of inherit, uh, inherently interpreted models. Uh, so the library uh, core philosophy behind the MIPE library that it's multimodal and that uh, it is scalable. So we put a lot of engineering efforts so that the algorithms run um, on different GPUs so that people do not struggle uh, with the performance when they want to do like online um, interpretability of a model. Um, so we have uh, internal use case. Uh, so it, it is also used for different research papers. So many people cited to use their publications. So we have many contributors and collaborators both in internally and externally from various different research institu institutions. Wow, thank you so much for that. Um, we're running a little bit behind, but I want to get a question in from you, Merve. Um, how about, uh, have you seen any real examples of teams who have used ethical AI frameworks successfully? I have, although I'm, it's a, I will not uh, name names. <laughs> uh, just not, uh, not to be endorsing any company or another. Uh, what I will say is, uh, because it's... Um, Growing industry, you know, where we say ethical framework, there is no like as widely accepted frameworks. So what you see usually, and you know, my work being a consultant and trainer allows me to see different models uh, across organizations. Um, it's either um, rarely it's companies who have the capacity, internal capacity, build their own models. Uh, that match their principles, their AI principles, and kind of make that work. Uh, so it's their selection of principles and the framework. Uh, or it's developed by these like ethical frameworks are developed by consultants like myself who have, you know, interactions and come in to support clients uh, and, you know, kind of help them use a framework. Ideally, what I'm also trying to do is um, the thing which works Coming back to you know where it actually works, um, where it actually works better is if the company is committing to that, uh, helping the organizations to build that internal capacity and understand uh, to understand the fundamentals of ethical frameworks, get them to experience the framework that I'm bringing in, but kind of helping them to build that muscle, ethical reasoning muscle, and why like how to, how to question things so they can turn that around, use that to adapt it to their own needs and their context. So they understand the fundamentals, they have a framework to start with. It might, you know, they might not have to do any changes to my framework, uh, but they at least know how it interacts, how things interact within it, what kind of, you know, things that they can do with it. Uh, and best practice is kind of adapting that to their own needs, to their own products, their own um, internal processes and, you know, product development cycle. Um, I think the other th crucial thing where it really works, uh, good examples or successful examples is, again, when from CEO down to developers, anyone and everyone in the company holds themselves accountable and liable for ethical and responsible development and implementation. So when you're questioning something, when you're questioning your model, when you're questioning your metrics or whatever it is, your data, it doesn't come across as like whistleblowing at worst case. Uh, or, you know, it doesn't come across critical, but it is like, okay, we have a concern. If we have a concern, this might actually have an impact on an individual or society in general. So Let's have the tools and space internally to develop this or to improve this. Um, and I think that is, in the long run, will be like a brand differentiator. Companies who have established that as a second nature, as a culture internally, an ethical framework just becomes one of the tools that you use. Yeah, thank you. That's so helpful. Hopefully more teams will focus, make this more of a focus moving forward. Um, I right. want to thank, 
Yeah. Hi, Anusha. Welcome back. Hi. I know I was just going to say thank you, but uh, go ahead, Mary. Oh, yeah. Well, um, do, maybe do we not have there's one question in the chat. I don't know if we or do we not. Are we out of time? We are kind of out of time, uh, but you can take that That's one question. Yeah. No, it's, it's OK if we're out of time. Okay. Um, right. 